Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting ICPS webinar. Really, it's a roundtable. Today's topic is going to be Saracenia growing and breeding. We have several experts joining us today. And it is 2024. Now, last year we did lots of roundtables. And the reason why we're doing this is because a member suggested the topic and the experts. And if you have somebody in mind, or if you have a topic in mind, please reach out to me at education at carnivorousplants.org. I'm Kenny Coogan. I'm the Education Director for the ICPS. This year, May in 2024, we are going to the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, Austria for our international conference. This is for May 2024. We will be taking off 2025, and then we will be in the Americas in 2026. The date of the presentations is May 24th to the 26th. It's the 14th International Conference. We usually have them every other year. The conference organizers are the German-speaking Carnivorous Plant Society. They're hosting. The dates of the presentations, like I said, are the 24th to the 26th, but there are several field trips and a banquet and other things outside of those dates, you can go to our website or you can go to their website to register and learn more. And everything's going to be in English except for one presentation. The International Commerce Plant Society is a group of professionals and growers and scientists all over the world. We host, we try to host monthly webinars. And when I say try, I mean I'm always looking for experts and growers and people to show off their greenhouse. You could be, you know, an individual or you could have a nursery or you could be a scientist. Coming up in February, we're going to have a presentation on the evolution of carnivorous plants. Then in March, the United States Botanic Gardens is going to be talking about some rarer carnivorous plants. Then in April, flytrapstore.com is going to be giving us a behind the scenes look at their uh, nursery. So if you go to our YouTube channel or our social media platforms, you will see that we have five animated videos about growing carnivorous plants indoors, outdoors, how to feed Venus flytraps, um, lots of great beginner stuff. These videos are good for elementary school students, all the way up to college students. And we encourage you to use these videos and share them. The first Wednesday of May every year is World Carnivorous Plant Day. You can go to our YouTube channel definitely and you can see all of the videos that we post on World Carnivorous Plant Day. Each year I like to have about 24 videos we usually post them one every hour on the hour. And these are from people all over the world. Some of them are in English. Some of them are not in English. Some of them have English subtitles. They are growers and authors and scientists. And we're just celebrating the best plants in the world, carnivorous plants. If you want to participate, send me a message. You can uh, help fund our education and our conservation initiatives by going to icps.clubexpress.com and becoming a member, a paid member. Paid members can rec will receive our carnivorous plant newsletter. If you're a regular member, you get the physical printed copy, or if an e-member, you get access to our digital archive. And the cool thing is, let's say you become a member. You don't just get, you know, this year's uh, carnivorous plant newsletters. You get access to the last 30 plus years, 50 plus years of uh, magazines and articles and grow tips and field trip reports. So it's a huge database. Another benefit of becoming a ICPS member is 
you get access to our seed bank. Our seed bank is only as good as our members make it. So if you have extra seeds, please consider donating to the seed bank. If you log on to your uh, membership, you will see where you can contact our seed bank uh, manager. So I mentioned if you become a member, you can help support our education and conservation initiatives. One of our education initiatives is carnivores in the classroom. Uh, this is takes place every August. We like to we want to fund up to 50 teachers around the world to add carnivorous plants to the classroom. And your donations help a lot. We, we run on your donations. You can go to carnivorousplants.org slash donate, and you can direct it to education or you can direct it to conservation. If you go to that playlist for the Japan International Conference, you can see our conservation director, Carson Chuxler, talk about some of the very important Saracenia conservation work that we were able to fund because of your donations. This year, these organizations, these nurseries, and one individual helped fund the Carnivores in the Classroom grant, and we thank them profusely. Now, if you notice, I'm wearing a Saracenia t-shirt, and you can also look cool by going to our store, which drop ships, which means you can be anywhere in the world and order our merchandise, tote bags, mugs, t-shirts, hoodies. We have a uh, Aldervanda hoodie. We have a Dracera Capensis hoodie. We have World's Carnivorous Plant Day merch. This year, it's gonna be May 1st because it's the first Wednesday of May, so the date changes every year. But all of those proceeds of that store benefit our conservation and education initiative. And with that, I hope you enjoy our Saracenia growing and breeding round table. Well, I'm Gary Addington, and I live up in Stanwood, Washington, and I've been growing these for maybe 40 years, but intensely for 30 years, and super intensely for the past 10. And I can't quit now. It's too late to come up with anything different. <laughs> hey guys, I'm Jeremiah Harris. I'm from Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I've been growing carnivorous plants since about 1992. Um, my large greenhouse have had up and running since about 2008 now. So I'd say pretty, pretty intensely since about 2008. Um, I remember Kirk and I uh, running the Colorado Carnivorous Plant Society in about 2003, if I want to uh, say that was about correct. So Kirk's one of my oldest uh, carnivorous friends, that's for sure. Hi, I'm uh, Kalen Hall. I'm in Portland, Oregon, and I first started growing carnivorous plants when I was in seventh grade. Um, and then I would say my most intensive phase started about 10 or 11 years ago. And I'm Kirk Simpson. I'm just outside of Atlanta, Georgia in uh, Snellville, Georgia. Um, I've been growing carnivorous plants for probably around 20 years, but seriously for probably around the last five. And I'm definitely uh, surrounded by some mentors of mine, Jeremiah, uh, first and foremost, when I was just getting started. Uh, and then Kaylin has been coaching me up over the last few years. So really honored to be here. All right. Well, we're excited to have everyone here. And I'm going to be asking the panel a series of questions that we got from social media. The theme is Saracenia breeding, but we're also going to get into we're going to get into a little bit of just growing Saracenia in general. But the first question we'll ask is how to store pollen in order to pollinate other flowers that are not ready yet. Kirk, you want to take it away first? Yeah, so I'll start. I'm probably the least qualified to answer this one in particular, but um, I think the most handy method and most practical method I've found over the last few years um, is actually if you have a flower that you don't plan on pollinating, actually cutting the flower and putting it in water and then putting it in the fridge. Um, and I've been able to keep pollen that way for about two weeks, um, just allowing it to kind of ripen on its own in the fridge. 
Uh, and then you can harvest it in the fridge and keep it even longer. But I'm sure these guys have some even better tips. Uh, Jeremiah, do you have any any handy tips for pollen storage? I have never stored Saracenia pollen for more than 20 minutes. Um, I think somebody <laughs> sent me some pollen in the mail once, but didn't have any success with it. So if I, I always have multiple things open, so I just immediately pollinate what I want to. Um, I've never cut flowers to put them in the fridge either. It's just, if it's in flower, I'll pollinate it. If it's not, I don't. And kind of the same way, if I'm not going to use it, I do uh, pop off some of the, the new buds if it's a new um, arrival for me. Yeah, just quickly, um, I found pollen will last in the fridge for about three weeks, maybe more, but I don't trust it past about three weeks. I'll store it in foil packets that are labeled. Um, and then not everybody will have this, uh, you know, the facilities to do it, but um, if you grow seeds under lights, you can uh, force plants under lights to advance flowering times. And then I also have my collection split between uh, outdoor grow area and the greenhouse. So I can bring things into the greenhouse if I want them to flower early, uh, which is good if I'm planning to use a certain clone in a lot of crosses, I will bring it into the greenhouse so it flowers right at the beginning. And, you know, learning to time the flowers is a bit of an art, but those are some options you have. Um, so not so much storing pollen, but uh, altering flowering times. So you get things to line up better. Do you think it's good to open a seed pod before they crack? Or do you uh, think it's better to wait for them to open up naturally? You know, basically, I take them when they are turning brown, and that's it. Um, either completely brown or halfway brown. And um, I know some people have actually gone with things that aren't ripe yet. It would seed somewhat green. I've never done that. I've heard that it works, but I've never done that. I simply harvest them as they turn. It's a long period. And uh, because I'll do several hundred of them. And um, I just wait, go through it a couple times a week and take what looks about right and, and just keep it in time ready to sell it. Has anyone noticed the uh, impact on germination for kind of prying the seed pot open or waiting? Uh, so I usually do harvest when the pod is green, but late in the season. So um, like late September here usually works pretty well. Early October, the pods will be green, but the seed coat is fully formed. So when you open those pods, the seeds will look brown. Uh, one year I was did an experiment, but unfortunately on too many crosses, more crosses than I should have. And I harvested pretty early, which was uh, July for me. And many of the seeds had not formed their seed coats. So the seeds still looked green or yellow in the pods. And I had very, very poor germination uh, with those. But if the pot is green and the seeds are brown and the seed coats are, are formed, uh, it seems to work pretty well. All right, so what is the longest it can take for, seed, for Saracenia seeds to germinate? When is it time to give up? I, mean, I think uh, I, the latest I've had one germinate is probably around two months uh, after sowing. Um, but I'm sure, you know, if I allow things to go longer, you know, maybe I might get a little bit later germination. Uh, personally, for me, once I get to two, three months, I kind of need the space. And if it's not moved by then, I kind of assume that it's, it's time to move on. Uh, Kaylin, what about you? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I've had, I don't know, sometimes I feel like maybe a seed doesn't get proper um, stratification the first season around. So I've had strange circumstances where I've um, germinated under lights and then brought plants outdoors a while later. And then I've had a new round of seeds germinate in that pot that did not germinate the first time around. Um, but yeah, generally, um, if it's not moving within a month, I'm really worrying. And yeah, definitely two months, I would agree. It's probably not gonna do anything. But you could try restratifying and seeing what happens, but it's probably a long shot. I was going to mention that we got yeah. 20 random questions, and I'm trying to put them in order. 
But Kaylin just mentioned stratification. And Jeremiah, can you tell us what stratification is first and then ask your question? Yeah. So it's like a cool, damp um, starting of the seed. Um, so you keep it either in a fridge or if you have a relatively cool greenhouse for usually about a month to three months. And it helps kind of the water enter the seed coat and quickens germination. Um, I do get germination on Saracenia seeds. I don't stratify, but usually not uh, as quick or as healthfully. All right. Thanks, Jeremiah. All right. What was your question? Uh, how long do you guys usually find your Saracenia seed is viable for? I mean, after that, like three year period, I tend to kind of get rid of most of it, maybe four years, but you guys played around with anything longer than that. I think Jerry might be the most uh, qualified to answer that one. Jerry, do you have any thoughts? Well, I have, uh, I haven't sown any seed that was um, more than a year past. Hmm. Um, but it, I got nearly 100% germination on that, and it hadn't been stored in any particular way. It was just room temperature stored, and it seemed to germinate as well as the oh. seed that was planted on time. But that's all I really got on it. And as far as um, when to give up on it, it seems to me that the seed either germinates very quickly and pretty uniformly, or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And um, and if it doesn't, well, something went wrong. <laughs> but generally, germination is quick, vigorous, and very uniform. When you have like sporadic germination, are you guys also concerned? Definitely. Yeah, for me, it usually comes down to the freshness of the seed. I, I usually have pretty good germination on anything that is, you know, sown within, say, six months of being harvested. Um, but beyond that, it gets a little bit spottier. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the rate overall goes down. It just means that they take a little bit longer to reach that 80, 90, 95 percent germination. Um, so it happens over a month, two months, rather than kind of all at the beginning. So one of the questions we got on social media was some seeds are tiny while others are large. Does the size of the seed matter? Are bigger seeds more successful? Or what have you guys noticed? Hey, I'll go. Um, it seems to me, of course, you've got species with small seeds, you've got species with large seeds. I don't see a lot of variation in a seed pod as far as seed size. But there's a lot of variation between seed pods that come from plants that have different genetics. And it doesn't seem to make any difference at all to me as far as germination goes. Um, yeah, seed size is, hasn't even been anything I've really thought about. I'd agree that, yeah, if certain species, the seed is so much smaller and as long as it's viable seed, it seems to germinate fine. Agreed. Yeah. And to your point about color, too, I've definitely noticed different colors of seeds, and I've never noticed any difference in germination or vigor based on seed color either. All right. So let's say we're all successful. We have germinated the seedlings. Do you want to put them, do you germinate all the seedlings in a kiddie pool? Or do you put them in like little cells? Or do you put them in one four inch, you know, pot? I'm sure this is preference, but have you, as you guys have done it many years, what's the easiest way to control or, you know, maintain a large population of seedlings? After they germinated? Yeah. Whoa. Or I guess where are you sowing them is, is maybe the better question. I'm just germinating. I'm just sowing them in two and a half inch band pots, 31 to a flat, maybe 20 flats. And I crowd them, you know, 50 seeds per two, uh, two and a half inch pot. And that's fine. They're really crowded. I can't seem to plant less seed. That's <laughs> a personal problem. And it's a indication of how far this disease has ramified in my brain. So I do plant a lot of seed, and then I have to deal with that afterwards. 
Yeah, yeah I, I think it's the same thing as Jerry and I'll plant in two two inch pots or sometimes bigger and you know one cross per pot one pot per cross usually and then it's on me to transplant at a at a proper time before they just get super out of hand and overcrowded um and I do uh <clears throat> sow and germinate and grow my seedlings under lights for for a couple of years so that could influence yeah. it um but yeah, I've never done flats or anything like that or individual, like one seed per little cell plug, which I've seen some people do as well. So how many seeds are you saying in a two inch pot? I have the same problem Jerry does, man. I will put way too many seeds in a, in a pot, but yeah, 50, 50 is seeds. good. Um, okay. Maybe 75. Yeah. it It's so tempting though, to just sprinkle a few too many in there. And yeah, how many think... how many seeds are in one pod? A a pod on the plant? Yeah. Ooh, it varies, but man, I feel like Lucos have the most seeds that I've never counted, but I mean, at least a thousand sometimes, and then Flavas can be big, easily five hundred. A latest like a full pod is like five hundred to a thousand seeds, but then a lot of times it can be very few seeds, especially with complex hybrids. Sometimes you only get a handful of seeds per pod. Plants also vary. Some plants are just bad seed producers. And so I'll need to make like six pods of one cross on that plant to get 50 seeds, right? So that's something you can plan for as you kind of learn how the plants work. But yeah, there can be way more seeds than you could ever use on, especially glucose and things like that. Yeah. And like Citicina for me, if I'm doing hybrids with them, I get very few seeds out of those crosses. I mean, again, six to 50 would be a, a pretty successful Citicina cross for me. But I was curious how Jerry gets so many amazing Citicina hybrids if he gets a few more seed off of those. Oh, I don't, um, I don't get as many seeds on Citicina hybrids. Is I do one flava hybrid. And then some I have flava citocena hybrid. And the citocena giant has bigger flowers and bigger seed pods than the normal species. So I can, since I do most of my work with uh, the giants, that uh, there's, there's a sufficiency, but that's because I have a lot of plants and a lot of flowers. So I end up with a lot of seed pods to make it up that way. Cool. A person came over and we were looking at my Nepenthes seedlings in the big 1020 trays. And they said, yeah, you can call like 90% of these. And, you know, these 10% that are really big right now, these are the keepers. Just move them up into a two and a half inch pot or whatever. So the question is, can Saracenia seedlings can slow plants, can they become vigorous as they age? And can vigorous seedlings slow down as they age? Or are we just picking the biggest colorful ones at the beginning and saying we don't have time for the other 950? Jeremiah? Yeah, I mean, I would say I usually try and pick my favorite to keep for myself, even at a relatively small size. Um, it, I do think it's something you kind of like, this is something I'm looking for in this seedling. So it kind of stands out to me at a relatively young age. And I'm so constrained on the space that I have in the greenhouses. I have to be very particular about the ones I keep for myself. So uh, even a small size, I have to really choose that maybe one out of a hundred that I think is worth taking up space in the greenhouse. And I think we kind of mentioned that last year's um, when we we're doing the, a similar round table. So it might not really be vigor because if you're looking for like a black or a hairy mm -hmm. plant or a striped, you know, mouth or something, right. You're going to select that regardless of how fast it's Exactly. I mean, for me, it's it's much less how vigorous it is. It's more what that exact 
seedling looks like where if I'm really going for like either like a tricolor where it starts kind of white up top goes really dark and then it kind of fades to green or if you want really deep red throats uh, you can usually get an idea of that pretty early on. Okay, Kirk, how do you uh, call your seedlings? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm probably less selective than the group here. I try and hold on for a little bit longer. Uh, to the question about like whether they'll speed up or potentially slow down, I've, I've seen it happen, but I would say don't bet on it. Uh, generally, if you notice a vigorous seedling at the beginning, it's going to be vigorous. If you notice one that's a little bit runty, it's probably going to stay on the small side. Um, you know, to Jeremiah's point about, you know, selecting traits within, you know, your coals, I think Flava is a really good place to start if you want to learn about selecting for traits, because if you get, you know, a flava that has multiple types within the seeds and the genetics, you can see rubra corpa, you can see atro purpurea, you can see caprea, and you can select based on what you want. If you want red tubes, if you want, you know, golden tops, if you want strong veins, all of those kind of traits. <clears throat> Again, one thing I'd add is I find different plants will grow at different speeds as well. So like uh, miners, roseas, leucos, very, very fast under lights where I grow them. Flavas don't like to be under lights very long. Oreos are the worst, absolute worst. Um, mm -hmm. They'll often stay small for a long time and then be very vigorous uh, once they're removed from lights. So if you have a, a compot of flavas that stalls out after a while under lights, they may well be very, very vigorous plants. They're just not loving the under lights thing for, for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. Purpurea is another one. I see something like that with me where once it gets to a point where it has mature pitchers, it takes off, but it takes a really long time to get to that stage. So one thing I do to stimulate the vigor is I transplant my purpurea a lot more frequently to get them to get to those adult pitcher sizes. And then at that point, they seem to take off a lot quicker under the lights specifically. All right. So Kirk, did I just hear that uh, you're growing the seedlings under lights? Yeah, that's how I start. I'm uh, similar to Kalen, and I'm sure similar to Jeremiah. And I think, Jerry, you also use some lights as well. Oh, Jeremiah, you do them in the greenhouse? Yeah, okay. just have them in the greenhouse. No extra <laughs> lights for Saracenia ceilings. So, yeah, to maximize my space, I have you know a grow light set up out in my uninsulated garage where I start everything for about two years. Um, you know, So I start everything similar in a, a compot like Kalen and Jerry talked about. Uh, and then, you know, kind of transplant them out when they seem like they're getting a little bit crowded. Uh, but one tip, I think it was Kaylin or Jeremiah, I don't know which one of you told me this, but um, transplanting them at that young stage seems to stimulate them for whatever reason. Um, you know, even if they're still in a somewhat crowded environment, just giving them fresh soil seems to really speed them up for me under lights. I've certainly noticed that uh, we probably probably did have that conversation. I think they, I, especially at the seedling stage, I think they like disturbance a little bit. It's like, even if they're not that crowded, but certainly if they are, when they get transplanted and spaced out, they'll kind of sulk for a couple weeks and then they go nuts. So, yeah. you know, definitely don't be afraid to transplant your seedlings. Um, they like it. So today's uh, roundtable is about Saracenia, but Jeremiah, don't you agree that Nepenthes seedlings also like to be trans? The, the more you transplant them, the better. I mean, I shoot for every six months for wow. Saracenia and Nepenthes uh, seedlings. But yeah, I mean, I think if you could transplant them even more often than that, I would. Even super rare, slow growing Nepenthes, they just, they love that root disturbance as a young seedling but then once they mature I repot nepenthes every 10 years maybe all right is everyone still here or do we lose somebody jerry i don't see up anymore <laughs> jerry we'll, we'll give, we'll give i think jerry. i see him off to the right but his camera yeah <laughs> oh, i see um well when jerry joined us 10 years maybe <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome back. I would like to mention something on culling. Yes, please. Red, red show up right away on Saracenia, but whites develop slowly. And if you hmm. call quickly, you may find that if you give them stuff away that you call, the people end up with some really great white plants, but you didn't see it quickly, as quickly as the others develop. 
the reds do show up right away. Whites take a while to the show. So mm. you don't know. You don't know what you got right away. That makes it difficult. Oh, everybody's frozen. This is the insider tips that we need from you, Jerry. That was a <laughs> good. That was a good one. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I totally agree. I, I, um, you know, it's always a balance to strike between how many to keep from those that first compot when you can't really see the traits, especially for whites or complex hybrids where there's a lot of different subtleties that might emerge later, um, and and how to you know deal with the fact that you don't have enough space to keep every seedling. But um, yeah, pinks too can show up a little later. Definitely whites. All right, let's go around and say, uh, what are some traits that we're all striving for? Like individually, um, I think everyone's impressed with Jerry Citicina crosses. And I remember last year people were saying like, where's all the Citicina crosses? And then they're like, oh, Manny Herrera and Jerry Eddington. <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, I feel like my projects can stretch a little bit long. Um, it's always exciting to breed with new stuff that's coming into flower for the first time. So whatever it is, if it's like a new Luco clone, it's like, Oh yeah, I want to breed with that. Um, <clears throat> but for a few years now, I've been working on really nice Luco Albas. I love Luco Albas. Mm -hmm. um, Jeremiah, I want to know what that big white thing behind you is, by the way, <laughs> that is gorgeous. Um, it's a good one. You want to take a guess? We've all been thinking it. <laughs> Is that that white mouth Luco clone from, um, or is it? No, I don't know. Is it Top Lady? It's Top Lady, exactly. Wow, that's the whitest I've ever seen. Top Lady, it good just job. Just opened, but like this last year's pitcher was like half the size of this new one. So really excited. And that's a spring pitcher, I'm dying, Jeremy. Spring, I'm absolutely dying. Spring I, pitcher. I just got so. Top Lady for the first time. I just got it like a month ago. So we'll see how it does here. Um, nice. Anyway, so I take up too much time. Um, but one of my projects that I've been really enjoying is breeding solid white plants that pitcher well in the spring. Um, cause we have a short season here in Oregon and especially outdoor growers without a greenhouse often don't do particularly well with Luco. I know I didn't for a long time. So getting some, like something that looks like a Luco in fall, but in spring has always been an ambition of mine. Um, and I'm just starting to have success with that after a couple generations um, using Oreo phyla to spread out the whites and breeding that back to Luco and doing things like that. So that's um, that's a project I've been working on is just better spring whites. Um, so, so, the, you have, so you get seedlings and then how long does it take for you to know that you'll have a good spring pitcher versus the fall pitcher? It's hard to say. I mean, I think the background is important. So, um, for example, the plant that I've been using, um, it is um, Vintner's Treasure by Oreophyla, one that I call White Clone, very creative, but it's very spring dominant. So it's Vintner's Treasure crossed Oreo. It has good white genes. It displays a lot of white color, but it entirely produces its pitchers in the spring. It never produces fall pitchers. So um, spring dominance tends to be dominant in a cross. So I selected that clone to cross with Lucos um, to get plants that are going to skew a little bit more towards the spring. Um, but I've had to just put stuff outside and see what it does. And a lot of them so far actually seem to want to do two crops. So they'll make nice spring pitchers and then they'll sit there and then they'll make nice fall pitchers as well, at least where I'm at now. Um, and now the question is, where do I go even further to try to keep the white and, and bias that spring dominance. But um, yeah, to, to, to be brief about it, but um, does that make any sense? Um, you know, yeah. seasonality of the parents involved is important when you're talking about, you know, what you kind of traps you're trying to get out of it. Yeah, I think that's what maybe some beginners wouldn't think to select for because they're selecting for size and color. So uh, is uh, Jerry with us still? Oh no. All right, Kirk, you you can skip yeah. the line. <laughs> so and I'll connect with Kaylin's too, because I, I think that's a really worthwhile project. I so to give a little bit bit of background, most of the people that I work with um here that I'm trying to kind of 
generate some outreach for new, you know, just gardeners that aren't necessarily interested in carnivorous plants. So it might be the first time they're seeing a carnivorous plant, trying to get them interested and engaged. And so a lot of the times when I meet with them, it's in the spring when people are out buying plants, of course. And so I'm having to explain to them that these leucophila that look like nothing in the spring, know they're going to look really pretty and white in the fall. So having one of those that looks good in the spring is definitely worthwhile. Um, but going back to, I think, kind of my projects as far as breeding, um, breeding goes, just thinking about plants that are approachable for beginners. Um, so I'm really trying to do some work with some medium sized plants, plants that aren't necessarily three feet tall and big clumping plants, but, you know, stay kind of patio sized as I call it, uh, but still have nice color. And then also thinking about the climate here in Georgia. So something that looks really good all year round. Um, so it has a good spring crop like Kaylin talked about. Um, and those spring pitchers will hold on through our summer heat. And then it will also produce a secondary crop in the fall. Um, just to think about what appeals to people that are just getting into these, these plants and showing them really, um, these are all season plants that can not only be really interesting novelty plants, but can also kind of fit into an existing landscape and be really interesting plants just in general. Jeremiah, what are you working on? Yeah, I I love going to visit other collections uh, all around. So if I can go visit a, a carnivorous plant grower, I want to. So then I, I kind of see like, okay, what do I really like in these collections? And it's so amazing going and seeing like Jerry's or Callan's where like what they're doing. Callan, some of your leucophila I saw the other year were just spectacular. So I put some of those on my wish list. I think there was, was a candy ghost I think I got from you not too long ago yeah, that I'm yeah. pretty excited. And it was excited about too, yeah yeah so i i love like really big lids so sometimes that like king cobra or sun visor style and seeing when you mix that um there was chaos that was done a while back that i just love the size of lid on that um i mean i love mori eyes still i think i could have a whole greenhouse of nothing but mori eyes even even if it feels like we kind of reached a plateau in Morii breeding for a little bit. So we kind of need to bring some other stuff into it. Uh, I love perps. So some of uh, Jerry's like white perps. Uh, he has one called Gaga, which is my top wish list Saracenia for the last like two years now. So hopefully one day we'll be able to get a, a division of that. But yeah, I really like the the weird colors, the shapes. Uh, the sizes, um, yeah, just anything. I, I'm not a big species breeder, so I, I really like to kind of mix things and see what what turns out. I do like perp species, so to try and get like darker or a lighter perps is definitely a, a I don't know goal of mine. But yeah, I'm not I'm not particular. I like all of them pretty much except rubra. Not a huge fan of rubra. <laughs> All right, very good. So Jerry, we're talking about uh, what do you, what are some of your breeding projects for this year or over the next couple of years? What traits are you looking for? Well, I think I'm kind of known for mine of giant hybrids and cordii hybrids at this point. And I've been working on those for a long time and that gives that gives a range of structure of uh, architecture of the plants that isn't as common as stuff that most people work on, and that pleases me to do that. And I'm going to continue to hit that pretty heavy. Um, I see a lot of beauty, a lot more potential there. Uh, it's incredible that Saracenia, although it has very few species, has such a range of form and color. And uh, that makes them so damn interesting to work with. Um, I do intend, I, I'm looking for shorter plants right now, mostly, that will hold up well uh, in nurseries and for people at home. And the thing about the cordii hybrid is they seem to stay in one place better in the pot. They don't run all over the place. And they don't require as much attention as far as cutting back and so on. Um, they're very well behaved plants. And another thing in conjunction of working on this is plants that will hold their traps through the winter into spring so that you can have a plant that actually flowers 
with old foliage still looking good in a range of colors. You can get this with Cytosina anyway and Vicordiice, but I want to extend that into a wider range. Hmm. So that especially for neophytes, uh, people who are shopping in a nursery, they can see what the plant looks like year round. And they can see the flowers in conjunction with the foliage. And besides that, you know, that doesn't mean I'm not going to mess around with all the other stuff, but uh, those are my main focuses right now. I love it. We can tell how thoughtful you've been in this process. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think about it. I believe about it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, can the panel speak to any generalities of is the mother or the father more dominant or recessive? And if you can't answer that, are there certain species that are more dominant or recessive when you're breeding? Go ahead, Jerry. Wow. Okay. Wow. Right back at me. Um, <laughs> you know, I always meant to keep track of that. And I made reciprocal crosses and all laid that all nice. Says, I'm going to watch that. And then I forget about it. The plants get mixed up. They get moved around and I lose track of it completely. So I have very little useful to say on that, except I wish I'd done it. <laughs> all right, uh, Kaylin. Yeah, I've, I've heard this question come up and, and I can't say, you know, I'm so limited in space. I, I'm not like Jerry where I can make reciprocal crosses and really get <laughs> hard data on this. I would say um, I haven't seen hard evidence that there's a big difference. Um, and for me, the concerns are more practical, right? Like which plant flowers before the other plant? Um, which plant is a good pollen donor? Which plant is not? Um, so like Adrian Slack is notorious for being a bad seed producer, but it's a great pollen plant. So um, pretty much all the Adrian Slack hybrids you're gonna see out there use it as a pollen donor. Um, and so things like that for me are <clears throat> more uh, of a concern than which parent may um, kind of come through a little bit more making reciprocal crosses. Um, so long story short, it's a very interesting question that I don't really have a, a good answer to. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, as a rule of thumb for me, the good traits are recessive and the bad traits are all dominant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I can't really speak to specifics. I do know that, you know, tenor, uh, generally speaking, you know, the more robust plant will have somewhat more dominant traits from just what I've observed, but that's all anecdotal. And I definitely haven't done the, you know, testing to actually flesh out which traits are most dominant. Yeah, it it seems like you get a really pretty good variety with either. I've de definitely made a fair number that are the same with the pod parent and uh, the pollen donor and the reverse, but it seems like you get a pretty good variation on both. And like Callan said, it's more, okay, if it's a bad pod parent, I probably won't be as likely to use it again um, or as often unless it's something that's really worth the effort. Since you've been, since we've all been talking about pod parents and pollen parents, that was a question, but I had deleted it. But I guess we should mention Saracenia, they have both parts, <laughs> unlike Nepenthe. So you can have the male part and the female part. And the pod parent is like the female that's getting exactly. the seed. And the pollen parent would be when you take the pollen and you transfer it to somebody else. Yep, dad and exactly. mom. And now we can say that I have participated in the round table. <laughs> All right. So the rest of the questions are uh, maybe like the practical, getting the seedlings to a nice size. So the first one is, can you or do you hit them with max C or any other fertilizer? How soon? How much? How much PPM, parts per million? How do you deal with algae buildup? So uh, this question is really, how fast can we get that seedling to grow? So uh, Kirk, what are, what are some ways to, to expedite the growing, raising process? 
I'll speak really generally, but Kalen is definitely the subject matter expert on this topic. He gave me all of the pointers just to get started doing this, but Maxi definitely makes a difference. Um, you know, there's a little bit of variation between what kinds of crosses you're doing or how you apply it. Um, and I'll let Kalen speak to those. Um, but yeah, it definitely makes a difference. Um, I only really have the time to do it for crosses that I especially want to grow quickly. I don't have the time to do it for everything. Uh, but Kalen has some really great methods to do it effectively across a large collection. Uh, okay, I'll jump in. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Kirk. Um, yeah, so fertilizer is a must. Um, again, um, sort of caveat, I do grow under lights um, and I don't have much experience with fertilizing Saracenia seedlings uh, if you're growing them outdoors uh, season on season. Um, but yeah, fertilizer is huge. Um, and I start fertilizing as soon as I can after the humidity domes come off the seedlings. Um, important, do not fertilize when they're just germinating under the humidity domes. Uh, this is, you, you'll just get fungus and it just doesn't work to introduce nutrients into a really high humidity environment like that. Uh, so I've had some disasters uh, trying that out. Um, and the, the key is to find a balance between how much nutrition to apply, how much work it takes to apply that. Um, the, I kind of go with a less is more approach. So, um, and I will, I've moved from a pitcher injection approach to tray, uh, tray fertilization. Um, I used to, when, when I was raising fewer seedlings under lights, I would inject the pitchers directly with a maxi solution with a um, needle what's that with a needle or a syringe oh what would i do i i i used a spray bottle actually but i've seen <laughs> the needle technique um yeah just what like, i found that works really good is those little art supply <laughs> things they have a little needle tip and they've got a big bottle and you just kind of squeeze them in yeah sounds great i definitely don't think the spray bottle was was optimal um, <laughs> if you're doing pitcher injection, you can do some pretty high concentrations. So you could go 750, a thousand parts per million. And I think you would have no problems. Um, I've never had any losses from, uh, pitcher, uh, filling or pitcher injection. Um, I think if the fertilizer level was too high, you would see that individual trap die back but the plant would be unharmed. And then that would be your key that, oh, that was a little bit too much. Um, but that's very time consuming. And when you're growing a lot of seedlings out, it's just not practical to be injecting um, all the traps. And then the other problem I faced was if a plant is less vigorous and it's not presenting me as obviously uh, pitchers to fill, I might miss it. And then I'm reinforcing that. So I found myself having problems with uh, fertilizing things unevenly. Um, so I moved to tray fertilization, which is much riskier and much more delicate because the plants are so much more sensitive to nutrients delivered through the roots. Um, and so that's where the less is more comes in. It's, it's much less work and it's much more even and consistent. Um, and I think somewhere in the range of 115 to 180 parts per million is is probably optimal for that. Um, you're playing with fire if you're going up into the 200s, the 300s, to say nothing of 500 or 1,000 or something that you could easily inject into a trap. Um, and the other consideration is the metabolism of that fertilizer. Um, so when seedlings are small, their nutrient requirements are also small. So you're not going to be fertilizing as often. And as your seedlings grow, and when they're making larger pitchers, they will go through fertilizer quite quickly. Um, so young seedlings in the first few months might only get fertilized in the tray monthly. By the time they're six, eight, 10, 12 inches tall or getting up into my lights and, and burning, like I might be fertilizing them every week um, and, uh, and they're fine. Um, I also find that uh, sarcinias do pretty darn well with relatively low concentrations. So even like a hundred parts per million, they're going to grow pretty well, especially compared with if you're not fertilizing or if you're fertilizing um, inconsistently. 
Um, I use Maxi. I think any um, uh, fertilizer with enough nitrogen and micronutrients will probably work. So I'm not saying you have to use nitrogen or excuse me, Maxi, but um, that's it. that is the fertilizer that I use. I've always used it. It's always worked well. Um, I experimented with Osmocote pellets in the soil. Didn't work. They released way too quickly. Um, the release rate is dependent on moisture and soil temperature, and it's wet and warm in those pots. And I, I found Osmocote to be kind of a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, so the liquid fertilizers that can be dissolved are much easier to regulate your dosing. Um, and it's a big topic, so I don't feel super bad for talking extremely long. The last thing I'll say is that um, when seedlings are small, uh, soil flushing is uh, something that you need to think about. So what will happen is if you put 125 parts per million in your tray of small seedlings, uh, that will evaporatively concentrate into the soil. And so you'll find your soil getting really, really high in nutrients. You'll be, you know, you'll flush a pot and it'll be 500 parts per million coming out of the bottom of the pot. And so um, weekly I will flush my pots um, uh, until I'm getting a lower nutrient level in what's coming out. So I'll fertilize once, they're small, they're not using a lot of nutrition, and then I'll top water weekly and then measure the nutrient concentration in what is flushing into the tray, uh, starting with a dry tray, and I'll see what that is. And I don't wanna see that be too high, and I'll wait to see that kind of come down over a period of weeks um, before I add more fertilizer. Again, that's a concern when the seedlings are small, when they get bigger, the soil is shaded. There's not as much evaporative concentration in the root zone. Um, and the plants are using more fertilizer, so it gets a lot easier and there's a lot less of a risk there. But you'll, I've definitely done it where I didn't, you know, before I learned to flush, you've got these little seedlings that aren't using much, you know, their metabolism is, is small in magnitude. Their roots are very shallow, so the roots are existing in that upper part of the soil. And getting that evaporative concentration, maybe I put 125 in the tray, but that soil is 500 and the seedlings are looking terrible. Um, so that's, you know, that's something to keep track of, particularly um, early on. But, um, and it's been a lot of trial and error to figure a lot of this stuff out. Um, so yeah, um, that's probably the most condensed version of that that I can give. And I'd love to hear if anyone else has insights as well. Jerry and Jeremiah, are you fertilizing the seedlings? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, almost exactly like that. Um, if I start getting algae growth, I try and repot uh, again as soon as possible. So the more fertilizer I, fertilizer I use, the more I have to or I do repot. So it's finding that balance of what do I have time for? What do I have time to repot? And um, sometimes I won't fertilize my seedlings at all and they'll stay small for two or three years and I'm not that disappointed about it. And then when I have some extra time and energy, I'll start fertilizing them again, repot them a couple of times and they'll go from a relatively small seedling to uh, almost mature relatively quickly. But if I don't have room for it, I don't mind keeping them in a, kind of a state of suspended animation for a little while. Mm -hmm. like that. Jerry, are you using fertilizer for your seedlings? You have to. And I'm not using back seed, although I'm some, but by the combination is going to come out pretty much like back seed. And um, they're getting 100, 120 parts per million into the trays. And when you have as many plants as I have, doing anything else would be really tough. Um, trying to feed directly into the little tiny traps would be um, kind of like purgatory. That's <laughs> um, I think Kalen covered that really well. I don't have a lot to add over that. Um, 
I have I have experimented running levels up to 400 parts per million in the tray over a period of time. And they did okay, although I didn't run it long enough uh, to see, uh, to get an LD50. Um, so there's a lot of mystery to this yet. And something that may work great for somebody may not work as great for somebody else if the conditions are somewhat different. One thing I would like to say, we talked about germinating under lights. They should be LED lights. Anything else is just a joke at this point. Uh, fluorescent lights hummed, turned black, all kind and didn't put out a lot of light. The LEDs are wonderful and completely transform the possibility of avoid uh, the plants. And Jerry, do you fertilize your mature Saracenia as well? Or do yeah, we do. We run fertilizer on them in the greenhouses because there's no insects in there. Uh, okay, okay. They, they don't have any other option. You kind of have to fertilize them or as you say, they'll go into kind of a stasis. Mm -hmm. And since we're trying to sell them, we need to keep them going. Yeah, um, yeah. And they get leached out once or twice a year, but basically, uh, yeah, we just keep running fertilizer into the trays, to the beds. Really, really quick, a couple things I thought of, um, especially if you're trying to figure out if you're fertilizing your seed, like, are, are my seedlings liking what I'm doing? So if you're not fertilizing at all and there's too little nutrition, the seedlings will be very slow. Seedlings growing very slow can also be a sign of too much fertilizer. Um, so there's a happy medium where you should see steady increase in leaf size. Every leaf size should be a little bigger. And then one of the signs too that I've noticed that you can really pick out fairly easily if you're looking at your seedlings every freaking day like we probably all are is when the, when you're starting to push the envelope with um, fertilizer level, you'll see color drop. So if you see really hmm. nice, vibrant, colorful seedlings, all of a sudden they're looking kind of green, you know, yeah. they're starting to produce a lot more chlorophyll, pull it back. That is a sign yeah. that you're probably at the upper limit um, of your healthy fertilizer doses. Yeah, I've definitely had that happen before. And especially for um, adult Saracenia for me, where if I've over fertilized adults, they go green and your colors are just very muted and they, they look terrible. Mm -hmm. That's what Matt Soper said last year. He doesn't like to fertilize plants that are over two years old because of their color drop from the fertilization. All and right. You'll it, you'll, sorry, I just find it. You'll see it in the outdoor plants too, the mature plants. So, like a flava red tube, the first pictures will be very colorful outside. And then, if it produces summer pictures when the plant has already gorged itself, yeah. they're much, you know, they're browner, they're much more muted. So, it, it's not necessarily pathological. You see it in otherwise healthy plants, but I found it to be a useful indicator for um, kind of trying to figure out where you're at you know, how the plants are responding physiologically to the, to the fertilization. For those of you who use grow lights for the seedlings, how do you push the grow lights? How many hours a day in the beginning? Can you do it for 24 hours a day? The answer is yes from Carson uh, Trexler, but uh, what do you guys do? Jerry, how long are your lights on? Um, you know, I tried 24 hours on Saracenia seedlings, and it works for a while, but there's no doubt that they don't like it over a long period of time, so they're on a 16 or 18 hour cycle, and that works a lot better over the long run, uh, but you can get away for a couple months with 24 hour light if there's any reason to do that. But I would not run it for the full time that you have the plants under lights because they show they show their distress after a while. I've had the exact same experience as Jerry. Um, so I use 18 
And one tip to all you homeowners or, you know, uh, home economics people out there, your electricity rates are a lot higher during the evening usage peak. So all time, I'll have my timer such that the lights are off from like five to 11 when electricity rates are higher and you will disproportionately reduce your uh, energy bill from running your go lights. That's very okay. interesting. It's <laughs> it. <laughs> clever, clever kid. Like that. Could be the best tip of the round table. <laughs> um, all right, so Jeremiah, you're not using lights. When do you put the seedlings outside? Uh, I don't grow any Saracenia outside. Everything in Colorado is is in the greenhouses. I mean, I've, I've grown a few outside in the past, but... Uh, the hail here just really will damage stuff uh, pretty much first thing in the spring and then gets them again as soon as they're looking good again. Uh, I mean, they, you can grow them outside in Colorado, but you'll never reach perfection. And your seedlings go through dormancy as well? Uh, a, a slight dormancy. So in my greenhouse here, it's kind of a, it's more my highland greenhouse with a fair bit of Saraceni in it. So this side of the greenhouse never gets under about 45 degrees. And I only get about one and a half, maybe two months of dormancy in this greenhouse a year. Uh, I need to have everything kind of cleaned up and repotted, usually by Christmas or the, the pitchers and flowers will already be emerging. And if you repot them right as their, their flowers are emerging, the flowers look weird, the pitchers look weird. So usually that's my December project is get this greenhouse all ready to go and then by mid-January I'll be getting my first flowers in here and they're looking pretty darn nice by kind of end of April. All right anybody else about dormancy and seedlings do we need to worry about it the first two years four years what what's and for what it's worth, I always move the seedlings from under lights into the greenhouse. If I'm going to have the space for it, I don't do that till about May 1st. I tried doing it earlier and I get shocked. Then. So, and those are like five months old. I generally have. Are those just like five month old seedlings you're talking about in May 1st? I didn't hear that. So, uh, five month old seedlings? Do we uh, yeah. yeah, or maybe even older than that. Yeah. Depends when they germinated. Um, generally, I will have my plants going under lights for pretty much a year before they go out to the greenhouse. So, getting the timing down on that, there's never enough space <laughs> and there's never room enough. And until it's time to play the the light build and then well, and then it feels like whoa um but it's a juggling thing and i'm dealing with quite a bit of inefficiencies yet and i always think i'm going to beat the inefficiencies out of uh but um plants keep growing it's kind of like an exponential thing things get crowded here <laughs> yeah i i keep Plants, I skip two dormancies under lights, so they'll get, or at least they'll go two winters, right? If they're sown in the fall after they're harvested, that's one winter that they're skipping. They'll be under lights through that second winter. And then I usually bring them outside like midsummer in that second year. Um, and I've definitely made the mistake of bringing them out too early and they get all screwed up. They go dormant in summer and then they start growing in the fall and it's a disaster. Definitely done that. I have brought them out too late and then they get hit with cold soon and they hate it. I've lost a lot of plants that way. So I don't take any chances like right, like er, late June, early July is when I'll bring them out from under lights into the greenhouse, which is the most forgiving environment that I have. And that seems to work pretty well. And hopefully they've gotten like two, two transplantations in that time under lights. So, Kaylin, just so I know the timeline, the seed pods are ready late fall or early fall. Right? Sure. Yeah. So okay. if I harvest in October, they're germinating in December after stratification. So by New Year's, I've got, you know, wee little sprouts. Okay. 
and then they're going to stay under lights that entire following year. They'll probably get transplanted around six months of age if I'm on top of it, which I'm not always, not always. Um, and then that as I get into that second winter, that's when I'm going to start pulling out individual plants, maybe putting them in their own pots under lights. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, at the end of that second winter, I have still a lot of community pots. And then I have a lot of plants that I've individually potted. And then that second summer is when they will go out. Um, and I don't know how many dormancies you can skip. For me, like at a certain point, they just get too tall and they start hitting the lights and they're getting too big for the grow chamber. And I've, I'm going to have the next year's seedlings coming in. So then they have to go out. Um, so that's, those are just kind of some practical considerations that have prevented me from really figuring out how many winters can we skip with the uh, Saracenia seedlings? I, I don't know. All right. We have three, we have three remaining questions. <laughs> All right. One question is, can you introduce two, three, or four different types of pollen to one flower, and can you get genetics from all three plants? Oh. Jerry, did you say no? I'd, I'd say you can put all kinds of pollen on it, but each pollen grain is simply going to pollinate an ovule. You're not going to get two pollen grains pollinating an ovule. That just doesn't happen. In my uh, experience, as far as I know, that it can happen. Uh, so yeah, you can, just you can you can put mixed pollen on it. There's some breeders with other plants that have always used mixed pollen, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get traits from all the different pollen into one seed or more than one because that just can't happen. That's my take on it. But you can have diverse seedlings. Excuse me. You can have diversity in the seedlings. You have diversity on the seedlings, but each one is going to be pollinated by one pollen grain. You're not going to get it mixed up with uh, all the different genetics. Yeah, you could end up with a paternity of, uh, of uh, many different pollens. Like you can, well, I'm not a geneticist. I shouldn't try to take it any further than that. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass myself. But uh, yeah, it's a one-to-one -one thing. On, on that. And you can, and some people have, you can pollinate each stigma lobe with different pollen. So you could get five different seed batches, genetics, in one seed pod. But uh, that's the limit of what you're going to be able to do. You, so you're not going to get any magic reaction out of it. Yeah. All right, the last two Anyone questions. Got anything to say about that? Yeah, I, I think we're in consensus. <laughs> yeah. You can't have three parents yet. <laughs> no, although with genetic engineering going forward, <laughs> this brave new world, and yes. who knows what we have. <laughs> All right, the last two questions are, what is the quickest you ever had a plant flower from seed? And when is the best time to divide the plant? So we've kind of been talking about seedlings, but we haven't really talked about them getting big chunky rhizomes where you can snap apart. So uh, Kirk, why don't you go first? What's the quickest, what's the youngest a plant can, a Saracenia can flower? So it's funny you mentioned this, and I don't know if it's different by species, but uh, I actually have two purpurea crosses out in the garage right now that are let's see, 20 months old that have buds on them right now. Um, and it's it's always been, I've only had that happen twice now and it's always been a purpurea. So I don't know if that's, you know, something genetically, but um, I also, to the question about the light cycles earlier, I actually keep my lights on 24 hours. Um, and usually once a plant flowers under the lights, it's a pretty good signal that it's ready to go outside because uh, the other times I've had it happen, the plant will just, completely halt growing at that point it'll flower uh and then it won't grow at all until i put it back outside um so that's an interesting one 
as far as dividing goes, I'm actually going through doing that right now. I think um, kind of late winter, early spring tends to be the best time. Uh, but really any time when they're dormant is probably uh, ideal. You do just want to, I think, avoid putting fresh divisions out uh, if you get extremely hard frosts. Uh, my climate here in Atlanta is pretty close to the native climate for a lot of Saracenia. Um, and so we get occasional cold snaps down into like the teens. Um, and so I would try and avoid putting fresh divisions or dividing and repotting plants if I know we're getting into the teens in the next week. Uh, but outside of that, almost any time in winter for us is kind of fair game for dividing. I think the question was also asking, what's the youngest age oh, yeah. of a Saracena? Can you divide it? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I think that also, you know, depends on the species and the cross. Um, you know, I've had plants out in the garage right now that are a similar age to those purpurea, about 20 months um, with upwards of five different growth points. I think I probably could divide them if I wanted to, um, but they're small growth points, so I'm not going to. Um, but yeah, I think somewhere around that year and a half to two year range, if you really wanted to get aggressive with it, you probably could, if you had a plant with multiple growth points and a big chunky rhizome. Mm -hmm. Um, but I personally probably wouldn't even try that. All right. Uh, Kaylin, what about, what's the youngest plant you had flower? Yeah, I've, uh, I totally agree with Kirk on this. I think perps tend to flower super fast under lights. So yeah, I've had uh, particularly rosea because they love warmth. They grow so fast under lights. So I've had 14 month old roseas putting up a bunch of flowers. Um, yeah. And um, that's probably my record. Um, you know, things like flavas that hate being under lights there. I haven't had a flava flower under lights, but definitely perps will do it um, pretty regularly. Um, and uh one thing I notice is bringing the plants out from under lights into the greenhouse. So they're coming out midsummer. Um, two things. One, often the fall dominant plants in those seedling batches will react to the um, reduction in photo period by immediately producing fall pitchers, which is lovely. So like August can be full of beautiful leuco pitchers and things like that. Um, but it also seems to disrupt bud formation. So even rhizomes that are definitely physically large enough to flower, often those seedling batches won't bloom very much the next year. And it takes another year to see flowers on those. So as an aside, um, that's something that I've noticed. And, and I agree with Kirk, it's pretty common to have seedlings um, with multiple growth points at a pretty small size, well before um, they are of flowering age. But as a practical matter, I don't tend to divide those because I'm going to be trying to watch them and see if they're, you know, and, and, you know, they're, that's kind of before I really will have done a lot of selecting. And I don't know if it's, it's worth dividing, you know, worth propagating at that point. Um, and I would need a, a grow area 10 times the size that I have if I was going to divide all my seedlings uh, at that age. So I, I very much agree with uh, what Kirk said. Rosea, and there is a difference there. Rosea is almost a house plant, a window plant. Uh, there's only thing in the genus that I would say really might make a good window plant um, because it doesn't seem to have a great need for dormancy. Um, and yeah, I had one woman 18 months from seeds just under the germination lines pretty much. And it, uh, so Kalen had one at 14. And that's the only thing that I've ever had bloom without going to a dormant scene first. And Rosea would be a really good base for breeding serocentias to be house plants. I've considered that. And, and um, I think I will fuss them all with that. <laughs> and Jerry, what size of the rhizome do you like before you start making divisions? Like the size of your finger, or does it have to have a certain it's number of growth? Whatever I'm interested in doing, you know. Um, generally, it's going to be about the size of my finger. But I have uh, I have divided other smaller than that, but generally not. And I do it at any time of the year, depending on need. But 
the best time is probably in early winter so the roots can reestablish during the winter and uh, be ready to uh, face spring all bold and full of energy uh, but yeah I'll, I'll repot and divide all year round if I need to yeah actually Jerry I think that's an interesting point you just touched on um, that might bear fleshing out so you and I have had conversations about how you know um, fairly robust root growth on your plants during dormancy, um, which I found super interesting because um, <clears throat> we think of dormancy as being this time when growth is not occurring. Um, and I have not noticed it on my outdoor plants, but I've also noticed it on my greenhouse plants. Um, so while I agree with Kirk and I do my dividing in late winter, early spring, I think, you know, just to kind of expand on that, it could be better to divide greenhouse plants earlier since they are they are perhaps more active. And um, one of the more fascinating little tidbits I've ever had in a conversation is when you shared just how much uh, root growth was occurring on your Saracenias during dormancy. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, similar stuff for me, um, especially with dividing. I was talking to uh, Mike King a few years ago, and I was never getting great color off a lot of my Saracenia um, for about one year after I did a harsh divide and repot. And he was the one who recommended, oh, just do it earlier in the year. He also grows in greenhouses, so I think has a pretty long growing season. And that's totally changed how my plants look. So I get I get great color even with a super harsh repot um, that same year as long as I do it in December and don't wait um, longer into the, the winter. So for me, it's definitely the earlier, the better. Um, and for color, it does make a huge difference for me. Um, about getting plants to flower, because I don't grow under lights, uh, usually it's I would say three to five years for me, probably three years would be about the, the quickest I would have them um, flower, but I, I plan on three to five years, give or take. Huh. All right. Does anyone have anything else for the good of the group? <laughs> well, man, I, I thought the questions tonight were excellent. Um, really excellent mm -hmm. questions. Um, I will say I did not come up with any of them. I was sent them by people on the ICPS social media. So thank you, everyone. And if yeah. people have also this uh, panelist group, I also did not handpick. It was uh, people from social media. So if you guys have topics or people, send me a message because that's my, that's my job here at ICPS to get the people so we can educate you. We were talking earlier about you know, which parent predominates in a cross and, you know, if reciprocal crosses make a difference and whatnot. And I think there are some broad, as you do more breeding, you can definitely learn that a lot of traits do dominate, um, uh, particularly in simple crosses. But yeah, maybe you put it out there to the group as far as like what experience you guys have had or tricks you have for getting different uh, traits to come through in your hybrids. Um, like, I'll just give an example, like in a simple cross, Flava by Luco, um, the Flava will dominate in the first generation, in my experience. Um, as you get further down the line, something like um, the throat blotch in Rugelii will be very dominant and continue to show up in, in subsequent generations. But something like inverse veins is going to be a um, a recessive trait in the first generation, but might come out very strongly in a second generation. So just kind of putting that out there to the group as far as our breeding projects and what sort of traits we're looking for and what experiences people may have had as far as how different traits manifest and, and what things they might be looking for in plants and the the, the timeline of, of developing certain traits in hybrids. I mean, for me, it's seeing what uh, you guys have done, what some people like Travis and Robert Coe and Phil have done over the last few years and kind of getting some inspiration from them. 
Um, but yeah, I love to play around like, okay, so if it's, it's a back cross of something I really like, okay, so if I'm using the same mother that made this cross, do I get some really cool stuff? Uh, but a lot of it, I would say, is trial and error. And then over a few generations, you can kind of see, okay, what have you done that I like? And so how can I breed kind of more of that and less of what I don't like? Um, because my space is so limited, I do have to be very selective on what I personally grow out. Uh, luckily, Kurt and Carson have done some uh, growing out for me, and then will send me back some of the cool ones uh, once they've grown it for a little while. But yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really fun to just play with it over a few generations, and you can kind of see what has worked uh, and what hasn't, I guess. Yeah, and I think what I'm starting to experiment more with uh, in the coming years is just seasonality. I think we've talked about it a lot, but not as its own topic in this kind of roundtable. But, you know, going through kind of the seasons and having plants that will hold leaves all season long or produce different flushes or have really unique and interesting flowers or to Jerry's points about, you know, plants that will hold their foliage all winter long. And then you'll have a bloom on a plant that has existing foliage. I just think that's really uh, interesting to kind of explore the seasonality a little bit more of the plants and see which traits uh, you can carry forward, you can breed for in terms of I want plants that produce leaves during this time of year or plants that hold their leaves extra long or, you know, uh, just kind of play around with it that way. And that's what I'm working on and what I'm probably most interested in going forward. Jeremiah, I really like what you said. And it, um, as you know, I was kind of put on the spot and maybe that question was a bit of a ramble, but what you said was so spot on, um, which is that at the end of the day, like so much of what we do is trial and error. Like when you have more experience, you might have some general contours, but you don't know what you're going to get until you make a cross. So um, for folks out there who are interested in starting out breeding, like just try stuff, see what happens. Um, and I can definitely fall into the trap of like, I think I understand how these plants work. So I'm going to try a very specific strategy to get what I want, but I'm limited by that. And some of the coolest stuff that's popped out is when I didn't know what was going to happen, or I just tried something and I got very unexpected results. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a creative process at the end of the day. It's, and you know, have that fun, just try stuff, see what happens. All right. I think we'll, I think we'll leave it there. And if you end up with a plant that's all Phyllodia, you've made something. <laughs> Burn it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, uh, everyone who participated. I greatly appreciate it. And I'm sure our members will have learned a lot. And uh, thank you, guys. Until next time, have a great day. You as well. Thanks for organizing it. Yeah, thanks, Kenny. Thank you. Nice seeing you guys. Yep. Appreciate it. Good to see you. It's not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society, or ICPS, not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.